Okay, welcome back. Let's uh, continue with the class. Uh, right before we go ahead, any questions? Uh, any any of you have any questions? Any thoughts that you would like to share from what we are learning? No questions. Like to share any thoughts? I, are you able to? Uh, follow along? Is it something that is, you know, are you receiving? Uh... Everything okay? Shall we continue? Right. Okay. All right, let's read. Romans chapter 3, 23 to 26. Romans 3, 23 to 26. Yes, could one of us please read that? Romans 3, 23 to 26. Yes, anybody? Romans 3, 23 to 26. Romans 3, 23 to 26. For all have seen and fall short of the glory of God, and all are justified freely by His grace through the redemption that came by Christ Jesus. God presented Christ as a sacrifice for a, of atonement through the shedding of His blood to be received by faith. He did, he did this to demonstrate His righteousness because... In his uh, forbearance, he had left the sins committed beforehand unpunished. He did it to, to demonstrate his righteousness at the present time, so as to be just and the one who justifies through those who have faith in Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> all right. So here, Paul is writing to the Romans. He's saying this so wonderfully. For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Now, because of sin... Because of the cross, God could pardon the sinner freely. Right? But there were two legal imputations that occurred where even though God put all his wrath on Jesus, he was acting out of his righteous judgment. Right? What were the two legal imputations uh, that was imputed? Right? First one. The sins of the world were imputed to the perfect, impeccable humanity of who Jesus Christ was. And two, the perfect righteousness of God imputed to every believer at the point of salvation. Right? Two legal imputations. Right? The word impute means to, um, you know, it's basically to fall upon, uh, you know, to impute to, uh, is to fall upon somebody. There were two legal imputations. First one, the sins of the entire world was imputed, was you know put upon Jesus at the cross, the perfect man. And because of that, the second legal imputation is when we believe in the Lord Jesus and we accept the Lord Jesus at the point of salvation, you and I have the perfect righteousness of God. And we are perfectly righteous uh, with God. Right? We can re reconcile two things here. Even when he, God's character has not changed, even when he is angry with man's sin, God loves man and is concerned about man. Right? Even though he was angry with sin, God loves man. Right now, let let's picture this. Right, some of us uh, who are parents, right? What do parents do? They correct a child. They, you know, sometimes if there's the correction is not being, you know, uh, followed, there are times they will take the next step. Right, probably, uh, you know, uh, give a stricter punishment. But just because I punish my son or i say okay you know 
And one of the things my son does is he we stay in the apartment and he keeps going down. He plays with all the kids down. And I tell him this. You are not to go to the, towards the, the road because there are vehicles coming there. Uh, and there was this one time I saw him going near the road. And I told him, I, you know, I told him, uh, I was visibly upset. And I said, I told you not to go towards the road. You went towards the road that day. So for the next week, you're not going down and playing. So that was his punishment. So every day he would say, I want to go. I, want to. I said, no, one week. You cannot go down. He said, no, I will, I will, you know, obey. I will not go. I said, no, but I have to give that period of, you know, uh, punishment that has to be there. Only then you will learn. The le you will learn. I know now you understand, but that period of punishment should be done, right? Why? Because I love you. I love my son. It's not like I hate him or I'm angry with him that I'm not sending him. No, he has to learn, right? The same way, God, he loves us. But when we sin, we're building a wall. He hates the sin. God despises the sin in us. Right? So every time we sin, we are, you know, the Bible says that do not grieve the Holy Spirit with whom you are sealed for the day of uh, reconciliation. When we sin, we are, basically what we are saying is we are crucifying Christ again. So that's painful. Right? And it's a hard thing to think about. Imagine we sin, we are, we are, you know, the Bible teaches us that we are crucifying Christ again when we sin, right? But there is divine love. God is, you know, putting judgment on sin because he loves us. If he didn't love us, he didn't care for us, he would not have sent his son, Jesus, to die on the cross for us. And he would not have put the sins of the entire world on this one innocent man just for us. He did it because he loved us. But does he love the sin? No, he despises it. The Bible even says in a few versions, says he abhors. The word abhor means to, uh, you know, uh, despise, deeply despise, abhor it. I hate it. Right? Sometimes, uh, you know, there's this saying, you know, I read this in an article in a book. It says, God is love. And so because God is love, he must also hate. Meaning, right, his nature is God is a loving person. He loves us, but he hates, he despises sin. Right? Uh, and so we must be assured of that. We must think of this and we say, okay, God... It is a love that is true. It is love that is divine. It is a purifying fire. Uh, it's a love that, you know, is willing to leave the 99 and go after that one. It is a love that is so eternal. It's so powerful that it draws all people to him. But we can only taste it when we walk in, with our identity in Christ. Right? God is a loving God. Atonement teaches us that God wants to make a relationship with us so that he himself made a price, paid the price for us. God wants to have a relationship with us. You know, one interesting thing is there's no other religion where the whole aspect of God having a relationship with us, even Judaism, in the Old Covenant, uh, there was no... God having a relationship with man. I mean, God spoke through his prophets and, uh, you know, uh, but, but the relationship of being restored, a good relationship only happened through and after the cross. I love the book of Romans where it says, the first three chapters talks about God's, you know, the sin of man and how sin has turn people away from God. And chapter 3 onwards, he starts saying, God is faithful. And through his son, chapter 4, he talks about how, you know, we can call him our Father through the Spirit. There was a work of redemption. There was a work of reconciliation. Redemption means purchased and glorified. 
the court of heaven could not legally release us from bondage and slavery and subjection until a price is paid. The courts of heaven, meaning heaven himself, could, heaven could not say, okay, this man is a good man, so I let him go. Jesus says there's no one good, only but God. You know, in the world that we live in, you know, people have come, uh, you know, a lot of young people have spoken, you know, that I've spoken to, they say, Pastor, I live a good life, right? I, I, I don't, I love my parents. I provide for them. I, I love my neighbors. I'm good at my studies. I don't have any bad habits. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't have any bad friends. I don't use bad language. I don't watch bad movies. Uh, I'm not into any adultery or I'm not into any fornication. I live a good life. Right? Now, their standards of good is just by what they do. Now, what is the problem with that? That means I'm coming to God into God's presence by my own works. I'm saying I am good because I don't do this. I don't drink. I don't smoke. I don't have bad habits. I don't, uh, you know, watch. It. So it's all about me. I'm coming by works. Now, the court of heaven, meaning God himself, cannot can say, see, you're doing all this. You're saying you're good. Yes, you don't say, you don't speak lies. You don't uh, you know do all. You don't have any bad habits. All that is true, but your nature is sinful. Right? By nature, you are sinful. You have felt jealous about people. Nobody knows it. You have got angry. We have not showed it. Nobody knows it. That's sin. You have pride. The very fact that you're saying that I am not like this, I am not like that. It's pride. So pride is sin again. So heaven cannot release you and say, okay, you are righteous because we don't drink, we don't smoke, we don't use bad habits. It, it's not going to happen. There's a sin nature in us which has to be dealt with. And so what did Jesus do? When Christ paid the ransom, the price for sin was paid and there was dominion and the dominion of sin or the power of sin and death and Satan was the chains were broken off. Now, when you say, okay, I accept Jesus as my personal savior, I'm washed by the blood of Jesus. And now we can say, I thank God that I don't have any bad habits. I don't smoke. I don't drink. I don't. Why? Because I'm washed by the blood of Jesus and the Holy Spirit empowers me. It's not through my own works. So the whole dominion of sin and death can only be broken off by the cross without the cross not possible right uh, there can be no redemption of people without the payment of price and the cross was the uh, was an act of redemption the ransom was not something paid to satan remember this right the ransom the price was not paid to satan because god does not owe satan a ransom god owes satan nothing right remember this now, in the beginning of time, when Satan uh, tempted uh, Adam and they fell into temptation, God, or even before that, uh, pride was found in Lucifer and he and his angels were thrown out, three-fourths of the angels were thrown out from heaven. Uh, and, you know, uh, and so Satan and his demons are thrown out they are cast out from heaven now it's not like satan is telling okay wait i will tempt adam now adam has fallen because of me right so you have to do something for me only then you know uh, 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 people will walk without sin it was not a price paid for satan the cross was not a price paid for satan it was not a place of okay uh, okay since you tempted Adam, Adam fell. Now, uh, on behalf of that, I will die on the cross. And so uh, now please don't tempt my people. Don't, uh, you know, uh, don't do anything to my people. No, no, no. The, 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 you know, the ransom was paid 
not for Satan, but the ransom was paid for God. The, the ransom was for God, for his people. Satan has nothing to do with this. Right? Uh, it's, it's only what has happened is he's only crushed the enemy even more. He has defeated the enemy. He's cut off his head. He's, he, his heel has you know, broken off the works of the enemy. He has been defeated. And he will be completely defeated later on when we see in the thousand day after the thousand year millennium in Revelations. He will be thrown and cast into the lake of fire. He knows his end. Right? So he's already defeated. Through the cross, he's, he's completely defeated. Right? So the price was paid not to Satan, but for God's righteous judgment. Right? Mankind was redeemed from the life uh, of curse that is from living under the law to living under grace. We are now redeemed from the fall and we begin to enjoy the blessings Redemption teaches us that God desires so much to restore us that he himself would pay a price to make it possible. Romans chapter 5 talks about how, how the sins of one man brought sin into the entire world, but through Jesus Christ, this, uh, uh, all the sins of the world, the last Adam, he took it up on the cross and we all have redemption through him. One man's obedience, disobedient, many became sinners. But one man's obedience, many became righteous. One man sinned, death passed into many. And one man was sinless, many received eternal life. One man was disobedient, judgment was passed on many. One man was obedient and there was everyone was made righteous. One man sinned, many became slaves. One man was obedient and many have become children of God. One man sinned, many lost the sonship. One man obeyed, many regained that sonship. You see that complete, you know, everything was reversed. So it was, uh, you know, that whole portion in Romans, uh, Romans 5 talks about the reversal that happened. Right? Uh, and so God has done these wonderful things, the cross, made it, making it powerful. There are so many blessings that we receive through the cross. Uh, the, the challenge that we face in the world that we're living in now is one, to believe it because it's foolishness to those who are perishing. It's foolishness. It's not going to make sense. One is to believe. That is the first challenge. Two, is to walk in that belief. Because remember, the enemy is going to come and he is going to make us feel that everything that we know about the cross is just a story or it's just something that happened many years ago and you know we don't really, it doesn't really make sense or he may say it's a wonderful story. You know, the enemy has his ways of deceiving people. As this writer who says, who wrote about, you know, a couple of writers, they said that, uh, uh, you know, uh, I forget his name, but the name of the book is The Last Temptation of Jesus Christ by Nicholas. He's got a complicated last name, uh, Strasson de Corvi or something, right? Uh, it's a French name. But Nicholas, The Last Temptation of Jesus Christ. And in that book, he writes that when Jesus was on the cross, he looked up to the father and he said, can you give me one more opportunity? I want to live a life and experience the things of this world. And so in the book, it says that God, the Lord Jesus got down from the cross and the body of somebody else was replaced to look like Jesus. Jesus went with Mary Magdalene. They went away to another nation. They got married. They had children. And Jesus died in, in an old age. And the book became so famous that they made a movie out of it. Now, whose work is this? 
the enemy knows his ways to deceive people. Many people believe it. There was another writer, an Indian man, I forget his name, but he wrote that, you know, there's proof that Jesus escaped the cross and reached uh, uh, Kashmir and even went to Nepal. There's proof. I don't know what proof that is, but he says there's proof. And these are, and they have big followers. Then there are other people in the West who say that, you know, uh, they are the reincarnated Jesus. So as of now, as we are speaking, there are apparently uh, something to laugh about, but it's serious because the enemy is deceiving people. As of now, there are three people who claim to be the reincarnated Jesus Christ. One is in Australia, one is in the US, and one is in, uh, I think, Mexico. So they all three say, I'm Jesus, reincarnated. Now, who's who, we don't know. Right? But one thing we know is the Bible teaches us that the Lord Jesus will come on the clouds. He's a glorified Jesus. Right? When we read the book of Revelations, chapter 2, chapter 1, uh, end of chapter 1, it describes the appearance of Jesus. And he says, I saw one who was the Lamb of God, his eyes were like blazing fire, his hair was like wool, his feet like burnished grass, and out of his mouth came a double-edged sword. And when John, the disciple who used to put his hair, hand or, or, or place his head on Jesus' bosom at all times, John, that same disciple, sees it and says, he fell at his feet as if dead. Now, picture this. People are coming and saying, I'm Jesus, and all of these things. This is the work of the enemy. This is deceiving spirits that the devil is, you know, releasing in the nation. He wants people to believe it. Oh, maybe he is a reincarnated Jesus. No, the enemy wants people to believe these things. But you and I, we know the Holy Spirit in us brings revelation, brings, reveals the truth in our hearts. Right, so we thank God for that. Uh, let's go on to the next portion, uh, chapter 19, the power and the blessings of the cross. Let's look at a few aspects and then uh, uh, we'll see what we can learn from here. Right uh, Now, we know that the cross is a powerful thing. Right Now, it's not about wearing a cross and saying, okay, it's powerful. It's not about just looking at a cross and saying, wow, it's powerful. No, it is to understand what happened. Remember what the book of James says? Even demons believe there's one God and they shudder. Demons also believe what Jesus did. Demons also know, uh, you know, but their belief is an empty belief. They know what Jesus did on the cross. They know that they defeated. Yet, they, why is it that they don't have the power, they don't have the blessings of the cross? Because it is an empty belief. What we are going to talk about is the power and the blessings of the cross will be released upon his children to those who believe in him, those who believe in what he did for us. So to understand the cross or the power of the cross, we must understand this word called identification, right? What is identification? You know, sometimes we say, uh, so for example, Somebody is, you know, uh, gone through a very rough childhood, right? Say, for example, this person named David, he's gone through very rough childhood. He's lost his parents at a young age, but somehow, you know, some people looked after him. He grew up, he finished school, he finished college, he started his work, and he began to do well. Years later, David becomes a preacher, right? just an example, right? Or he becomes a, you know, a motivational speaker, uh, right and and he meets somebody else and he meets this person named John and John says you know David at a young age I lost my parents and I am still in this process of you know healing and there's nobody to look after me I'm still in college so what is David going to say David is going to say hey I, 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 I identify with you I, ex I know what you're feeling because I went through the exact same problem. 
right? That's, that's, I just use this example to help us understand identification. So I say, David says, hey, John, I identify your problem. I, I identify with you because even when I was growing up, I lost my parents and I you know, had to go to school, go through college without them. And it was very difficult, but here's what I did, right? So I'm, I'm identifying that person. Now, what did Jesus do in terms of identification? Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10, 11, and 14. I'll just read that. Jesus identified with... Uh, okay, let's read that. Hebrews chapter 2, 10, 11, and 14. Yes, could one of us please read that? Uh, Hebrews chapter 2, 10, 11, and verse 14. Yes, any one of us, please go ahead. Hebrews 2, 10, 11, and 14. Sally, would you mind reading it? If you're there. So sure, Pastor. Okay, Hebrews chapter 2, verse 10. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom... Uh, sorry. For it was fitting for him for whom are all things and by whom... whom are all things in bringing many sons to glory to make the captain of their salvation perfect through suffering for both he who sanctifies and those who are being sanctified are all of one for which reason he is not ashamed to call them brethren verse 14 in as much then as the children have partaken of flesh and blood he himself likewise shared in the same that through that he might destroy him who had the power of the dead, that is the devil. Amen. Thank you, Zeli. Right. So here, Hebrews chapter 2, 10, 11, and 14. Let's look at what we can understand from this. Right. Uh, firstly, uh, we see that Jesus identified with his birth. Right. Uh, Jesus identified with us in his birth. So now, all of us have been born into this world, right? Now, Jesus was before the creation of the world, right? He was there. He was the one who created the heavens and the earth. But how did Jesus identify with us? Jesus identified with us in his birth. He decided. Now, Jesus didn't decide, okay, um, I'll just come into this world as a 17-year-old young man, stay in this world for maybe you know another couple of years, do a few miracles, do choose the disciples. Do ev he could have done everything, even if he had come when he was 17 years old. Yes, all of us agree with that, right? 18, 17, 18, or even if he was 20 years old, Jesus could have come when he was 20. Uh, you know, by the time 10 years of preparation, 30 started his ministry, three and a half years, done everything that he that we read about in his ministry. Right? Uh, but he didn't do that. He identified with us in his birth. Right? So he became a human being. He was born like a baby. He was he was in his mother's womb for nine months. The conception was a miracle. But the process was natural. Nine months, the baby grew in the stomach. Right? Now, he identified us with us in his birth so that we could be identified with him in his death. Now, the same way he died, he didn't die in his spirit. He died in his body. Right? And through his death, even when we die, we are identifying with his death. Right? So that we could be identified with him in his death. So because of his death, we are identified in him. So, so he can say, I know how painful it is. He has tasted death for us. He has tasted being a child and he has tasted being a uh, the things of this world 
and he has tasted death for us so that we can be identified with him. Uh, we, we looked at all of this uh, previously as well. You know, there was no use of God, you know, Jesus just came uh, and then after one week being crucified and he dies. No, there, there was no, there's no identification there. Satan would have said, what is this? He came for one week. He just lived. I didn't get an opportunity to tempt you in every way. I didn't get an opportunity. I would have made sure that you would have sinned. Satan can come and say that. But now Satan has no grounds. He had 33 and a half years. All his attempts failed. Right? We can identify him, with him in his death. Jesus became like unto us so that he could represent us on the cross. He, he became like us. Jesus had the same human features, right? Uh, and we looked about it, looked at it last class as well in Isaiah that, you know, there was nothing that was beautiful or very great about him, right? Uh, and so he became like us. What was Jesus doing? He was doing his father's business, helping out his father. The book of James uh, says that, you know, Mark also says, uh, when they all came and saw that uh, this man is talking full of wisdom, they asked him, which school did you go to? Which, where did you get his education or his teaching from? Isn't this the carpenter's son? Isn't he the carpenter and the carpenter's son? Aren't his brothers with us and his sisters as well? Right? They identified with Jesus. It's not like Jesus was somewhere sitting in the mountains, and no, they, he identified with people. He uh, people identified him. Being God, he was willing to drop down to that level. In the mind of God, we were in Him on the cross. Wow, this is so wonderful. Imagine, God is crucifying His own Son. Jesus is on the cross, sinless man. But in the Father's mind, as he's looking at the cross from heaven, he's seeing all of us, all our sins, all our shame, all our guilt, our condemnation, our sicknesses and our diseases, everything he's seeing in the cross. He's not seeing his son. He's not seeing, okay, this is my beloved son. He's seeing us in Jesus in the cross. He's seeing as if we were in Jesus on the cross. So he's putting all the judgment upon him. What happened to Christ on the cross happened to you and me because we were in him. Only thing, we didn't have to experience it. We didn't have to experience that painful death. You know, what about people who are believers who are going through painful death, going through difficult, you know, I know a lot of, you know, well-meaning, very good believers who have gone through painful times of cancer. You know, the fourth stage, they've been so, you know, painful times, chemo and radiation and all of these things. And their body has just been so weak and it is very, very painful to see these things. But you know what the best part was? Each and every one of them were joyful that even if death passes, even if death comes, I will be with the Lord forever. So none of them were fearful of death. Yes, there was pain. There was intense pain being in the hospitals, being in the, going through these radiations and chemo and all these medicines and adverse effects on the body. Yes, there was pain. But through that pain, they still had an assurance that, you know, I remember this one person, this man, he was diagnosed suddenly with fourth stage cancer and he went through a very difficult time. He was a young man in his early 40s. Went through very difficult times of uh, chemo and radiation. He was doing well. Then again, it became malignant. Again, it started spreading. But throughout the whole ordeal, even through all that pain, one of the things he told me was, I am desiring to see Jesus as he is. 
So that is surpassing all the pain. That that wait, that joy of waiting to see Jesus. I will know I will see him face to face. I will be with him. That joy was surpassing the intense pain of coughing blood and all these things in the hospital. That is the difference. What happened to Christ on the cross happened to you and me because we were in him. On the cross, Jesus Christ broke sin's power of, of over our lives. Now, when we are in Christ, the power of sin has been defeated. Are we sinners right now? No. But if we have fallen into sin or we are living a life of sin, it is because we are allowing the enemy or giving him access into our lives. But the scriptures in Romans chapter 6 teaches us that the power of sin has been defeated over our lives. Imagine there's a temptation that's coming, it's coming, it's coming, it's getting stronger, it's getting stronger. And as a believer, you're trying your best not to fall into that temptation. But when we stand on this truth, the power of sin has been defeated. We ask the Holy Spirit to empower us. We will be able to overcome any temptation. It doesn't matter what kind of temptation, we'll be able to overcome it. Right? Uh, there are three things uh, in terms of uh, the power of sin broken in our lives. First thing, we must know it. We must know in our hearts that, okay, the power of sin has been broken. Two, we must reckon this to be true. This should be an absolute fact. Now, there will be times when the enemy will come and say, you know, last time you f you you fell for sin. You were you did this, such a wrong thing, and now you're praying. What will God think of you? What will God say? Right? Now, do you think God can forgive such a terrible sin that you have made? And what is the enemy doing? He's putting guilt. He's putting condemnation. This is the time we must know that the power of sin in our lives has been defeated. Remember what we studied? God does not owe Satan anything, nor do you and I owe Satan anything because we are God's children. We don't owe Satan. We don't owe him even an explanation. Oh, Satan, actually, that time you had come with the stronger demons, but now I'll be able to... We don't have to explain it. We must know our standing in God. Two, we must know it as we should reckon this to be true. The enemy will say, last time you sinned, this time also you can sin, and you can continue it because it's not going to help you anyway by you know walking in the truth. That is the time you say, no. I reckon this truth that the power of sin of sin and my life has been defeated. Three, we must walk in this truth. I'm not saying that we will not face temptations, but when we know these three, know, walk, and reckon the power of, of, of Satan, the power of sin over our lives will be broken. Right? So let's take this example. So if the enemy comes and puts a thought into our mind, you know, what you can do, you can, you know, just commit suicide. Better, you know, just end your life so that, you know, uh, you don't have to go through all these challenges, go through all these difficulties, put an end to all this. You know, you're living in debt. You have these problems, that problem, and you're living in sin. Anyway, you're not pleasing God through what you're doing. Why don't you just end your life? Now, when this comes, remember, it's the work of the enemy. What must we do? We must know what Jesus said. The power of sin has been defeated. We must reckon it. We must say, no, I'm not going to obey or I'm not going to take this thought. We, we must overpower it with the word of God. Three, we must walk in that truth. And when we do these things, we'll know that the power of the enemy has been defeated, right? So we'll stop here uh, and we will continue from next week uh, from uh, on the cross, how Christ annulled the power of the enemy. So we'll stop here uh, and we'll pick up from next week. All right, can we just close in prayer, please? Uh, Isaac, uh, is it okay if you can please close in prayer? 
Yes, Pastor, I'll try. Sure. Yes, go ahead. Father, we want to thank you for this wonderful time we have together. We want to glorify your name. We want to ask you to continue to bless our faculties, our pastors who are imparting knowledge in all. I want to ask Father, Father God that you give us a receptive heart so that we we'll hear, obey, listen, and implement your word so that we also will be a blessing to others. We want to thank you for every other thing that you are doing for the ministry and for APC. Father, I want to thank you. I want to glorify your name. May your name be glorified from eternity to eternity. This and every other help we ask in the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Thank you, Father. Thank you. God bless us all. Amen. 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 Thank you so much, Isaac. Thank you, everyone, uh, for joining. Have a great week ahead. See you next week. God bless.